little noise on my camera feed here. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the show. It is Wednesday. We're about to get busy. Good morning, folks. Today is Wednesday, November 23rd, 2022. Welcome to episode number 247 of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing. I'm your host, Dr. Gerald Osher, and over the next 45 minutes, I'll be delivering the top cybersecurity news stories of the day and providing expert analysis on each of those stories. On what it means to you as a practitioner, or if you're looking to break in the industry, we got you covered. There's a lot of great people in chat, a lot of great people. We're about to go around the world, y'all. But before we do that, I want to say shout out and thanks to the stream's sponsors, Barricade Cyber Solution and Recon InfoSec. Barricade Cyber Solutions is dedicated to helping businesses from cyber attacks and recover from the damage done. Cyber attacks can cause massive issues. I'm talking like just catastrophic, devastating issues, okay? And send hardworking, dedicated business owners into absolute turmoil. You don't want to be doing that going into the holidays. But don't worry, Barricade Cyber Solutions knows how to mitigate the damage done by cyber incidents. Check them out at barricadecyber.com. You got the website right up here on screen. Eric Taylor's uh, calendar is open here. It looks like he's uh, blocked off Thursday. No surprise there with the holidays in the United States. But he's he's got a lot of openings. Get on his calendar. Have a conversation with him. Figure out if Barricade Cyber Solutions is a, is a good option or is better than the nothing option you currently have uh, for dealing with uh, incidents, uh, especially like ransomware, which would just be devastating going into the holidays. Holidays. I also want to give a shout out and love to the other stream sponsor, Recon InfoSec. If your organization is large enough to have real cybersecurity concerns, but maybe not quite large enough to build a full-fledged SecOps capability from the ground up, check out the Managed Detection and Response Offering, MDR, from Recon InfoSec. Their offering includes people, process, and technology needed to deliver full-spectrum SecOps to organizations of any size. What? Did we just become best friends? Yup! Recon InfoSec, it's a security company managed and run by security people. They are top-notch, top, top-notch, in, uh, you know, b- basically security operations, incident responders, blue team people. They run a tight ship. They run a good operation. MDR is a really, really good option. If you are looking to like basically make your dollar go further, right? So b- budgets are getting tight as the recession looms near. CFO is asking you to make a dollar out of 15 cents. Little Tupac reference. Well, MDR is a great way to do that. Consider going to Recon Info Second talking to them. Links in the description below. I want to remind you, if you hold professional certs that require CPEs like CISP, CISA, CISA, each episode of the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing is half a CPE, so two and a half a week, 10 a month, they literally stack. Say what's up in chat. Document yourself as being here. It's literally the most enjoyable way to earn CPEs that I'm aware of. If you're live, love it. We're about to go around the world. Hopefully, we can do it. There's 72 of you in here right now. Thanks for being here. If you're watching on replay, hashtag Team Replay in the comments. Thanks for catching the stream. And remember, you can catch the stream in audio format only on your podcast app of choice. Just go into your podcast app, search on Simply Cyber. It'll pop up. We post the shows right after the live stream ends. And now, if you want to jump right to it, to the news, when the screen turns to the news, we're off and running. But for the next couple minutes, I would say... For the next two minutes and 22 seconds, um, we're going to try to go around the world. We do this every Wednesday. If you're new here, every Wednesday, we call out people, where are you at? Where are you at? And see if we can run the world. We did it last week. We did it the week before. We are running uh, a, a, a hype train here. So let's do it. Where are you at? Where are you at? Good morning from Cambridge, the MIT area. George Strasberger bringing North America online. Nice job. Love it. Hey, Georgia, what's up? Gulf Coast, Mexico. Love it. Texas is in the house. Big Texas. Oh, my God. Big Texas everywhere. I know Miami contingent's in here. Kimberly's up in here. Alley Cat's in the back. Alley, Alley Cat. Love it. What's up? Come on, Marilyn. I see you, Alicia Jerry. God is in the house. Kitsko bringing Africa online early into the contest. I love it. What's up? India. Asia's in the house. Thank you so much, Shane Himes. Upper Peninsula, Michigan, New Brunswick, Canada. Hello from the low country, Bill Donaldson. Raleigh, North Carolina is up in here. Indiana, come on now. Uruguay, South America, yes. Afghanistan's Middle East, yes. Hold on, Afghanistan's Middle East. Um, oh my God, I saw South America in there. Uruguay. Um, 
Chesapeake Bay, Maryland. Love it. Love that area. Jenna Harding, another low country local. Love it. What's up, Matthew Necci, bringing in Europe online? Guys, all we need is Central America if you want to. I mean, we've run the major continents at this point. Let's. Can we get Central America? I guess that might be Uruguay. Internal Stranger, Australia's in the house. I see you, Internal Stranger. Thank you so much. Scotland's in the house. Guys, we just blew this thing out. Charlotte, North Carolina, we've got 44 seconds. Let's see what else we can get. Good morning and excited to tell everyone that I started as a knock agent last night. Nice job, Mr. Kaiser. Way to go, way to go. Dominican Republic, Leonardo's online. Dude. Oh my God. Guys, we just absolutely devastated going around the world. That took us about a minute and like 90 seconds. Holy Jesus. Wakanda. <laughs> Michael Torres bringing the great country of Wakanda on. New emote. Enjoy that ninja emote, y'all. The more you know, go Joe, right? What's up, Jax? Scott in the house. Missouri's in here, guys. Well, congratulations. We just crushed around the world. That might be the most uh, overwhelming win for us in the contest as it's been. So good job. Thanks, Daft Punk, for doing that. Not only IT showing off the new Snake Eyes emote, Tom Bishop with the Worlds. Good job, everybody. Let's sit back, relax. We've earned it. Let's get some hot takes on some hot news. From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. It's Wednesday, November 23rd, 2022. Twitter enlists hacker George Holtz for a 12-week internship. Despite Twitter's rapidly diminishing workforce, Elon Musk has signed on hacker and frenemy George Holtz for a 12-week internship. Hotz is known for his security hacks, including iOS jailbreaks and reverse engineering the PlayStation 3. Interestingly, Hotz and Musk have history, as the two got into a spat after Musk allegedly tried to hire Stotes at Tesla, but kept changing the terms. Subsequently, Hotz founded Kama.ai, whose driver assistance system aimed to bring Tesla autopilot-like functionality to other cars. The two appear to have made amends after reconnecting on Twitter. Hotz described his new role at Twitter as being in charge of search for the platform. All right, so this is pretty cool. Okay, so this George Hotz cat, very, um, you know, well-known hacker, right? And, you know, when you when you crack the PS3, um, that's cool. A uh, little spot with, um, with um, Elon. I don't know what you accomplish in 12 weeks. Um, you know... Elon is trying whatever he can. Get your Elon emotes in chat if you want, uh, squad members. Um, Elon is trying all sorts of different things. He, he likes to move fast and, and break things. Um, bringing this guy on for three months, you know, I, I don't know. It almost seems like maybe that was just like an agreement. Like George Holtz is his own, his own uh, entity at this point. He's not going to like take a nine to five job, right? Obviously. So this is obviously some type of, they call it an internship. I think that might almost be playful. To me, it's more of a professional service consulting gig because George Holtz doesn't need an internship um, to help him. The one thing I would say about this, it's it's interesting. We'll see what happens, but it, it brings an interesting bigger point. Um, anyone, okay, anyone can be a red team or anyone can be a pen tester, all right? Now, having said that, like, I'm not very good at it. I, I, I dabble, but I'm not very good at it. I will say one underlying consistent trait that I have noticed in people that are very, very good at offensive security is that they typically um, really enjoy like taking things apart and understanding how they work, especially they've been doing it their whole life. Like every, every single person, not every single person, but many people I talk to that are pen testers or, uh, you know, offsec people at, at, at high levels, they literally, you know, um, just took things apart and to understand, like took their parents' phone apart, took their took their toy RC car apart, breaking things down, wanting to know how they work, wanting to understand the mechanics and, and behind it. And for George Holtz, like being able to like, you know, reverse a PS3 and all this other stuff, like it shows that he has those chops and that capability. So for me, my initial thought is, okay, Elon's actually trying to get an interesting kind of tinkerer, um, not counterculture perspective, but just the perspective of someone who isn't going to look at the problem the same way that Elon's looking at it or look at the problem the same way that marketing or, or software devs might look at it, right? So I'm hoping that this actually results in something interesting. I mean, Twitter right now is literally a dumpster fire. The dog, this is fine. That's what's going on. 
Uh, Elon's got enough cash to kind of burn, continue to burn for a while, but they've lost a lot of staff. Uh, and the final thing I'll say about Twitter and Elon, uh, I was talking to Paul Imey, uh, one of the leaders over at Ceteria uh, at Charleston B-Sides this weekend, and he pointed out something that I hadn't considered. Like everybody that got fired at um, Twitter, like there's probably tons of people still getting paid because they didn't get off offboarded correctly. There's probably tons of people who still have access to all sorts of stuff because they weren't properly offboarded because the people who were supposed to do the offboarding also got offboarded, right? So um, Twitter is a dumpster fire um, and I don't know if they're going to be able to pull up, but I see this as an opportunity to get interesting perspective and obviously the ear of Elon. So we'll see where it goes. Estonians arrested for masterminding massive Ponzi scheme. Two 37-year-old Estonian men, Sergei Potopenko and Ivant Rogan, face up to 20 years behind bars for their role in a crypto-related Ponzi scheme. Oh boy, crypto. Between 2015 and 2019, the pair allegedly coerced thousands of investors to invest over $550 million in Hashflare. Hashflare supposedly enabled investors to rent a portion of the firm's cryptocurrency mining operations <clears throat> in exchange for the crypto it produced. While Hashflare's website showed they were making big profits, in reality, the firm was mining Bitcoin at a rate of less than 1% of what it claimed to be. When investors tried to withdraw funds, the scammers either refused or paid them using virtual currency they purchased on the open market. In a separate scam, the fraudsters raised an additional $25 million convincing victims to invest in Polybius, a bank specializing in virtual currency which never actually existed. The duo laundered funds by using shell companies and phony contracts and invoices to buy at least 75 properties, six luxury vehicles, cryptocurrency wallets, and thousands of cryptocurrency mining machines. Oh my god. Okay, so first of all, let's do it. That's the sound of the police. All right, so these, these Estonian dudes, guys, Ponzi scheme, welcome to crypto. I'm a crypto evangelist. I love it, love it, love it. Dude, this is no no surprise, guys, okay? So coerce people. There's going to be so many of these stories. I'm so glad that the the um, the Department of Justice went after these people. I, I assume that um, the Estonians were either in the United States or the United States has a relationship with uh, Estonia for extradition. Guys, the concept of the Ponzi scheme, it's simple. Give me your money and you'll get unbelievable returns. And in reality, you're giving me your money and I'm taking it and spending it on luxury properties, luxury vehicles, crypto wallets, crypto mining machines, right? I feel like a lot of times Ponzi schemes start off with the best of intentions and then they turn in, they, they just start imploding on themselves and the, the, the people behind it have a taste for like the good life and, and then they start screwing people over. <clears throat> um, this group was selling um, hot trash it was getting less than 1% return on what they had promised people, not 1% return, period, because that would still be better than a savings account. They were getting 1% return less than what they had promised, which is awful. And here's the, the part where it really starts to pinch. When, they, when, when victims try to take their money out, the Estonians would refuse. Like that is some next level BS, guys. Um, you're seeing all these, there's something called contagion going on. Again, for those of you who are new here or don't know me, um, I treat crypto, cryptocurrency in the crypto world and the NFTs is like, um, is like a, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a dirty, it's like a, a dirty pleasure or like a, a dark pleasure, whatever you want to call it. Like soap operas. Like, like I don't invest in it. I don't care about it, but I find it fascinating. It's like pulp fiction to me. So anyways, um, there's going to be more of these guys because a lot of these individuals are taking money from victims and then investing in it into other crypto projects. And as the entire house of cards starts to collapse, they're, they're bringing each other down with them. Uh, so it's not good, but unfortunately, yes, they'll be able to sell the, the DOJ will probably be able to sell the properties, the luxury vehicles, the mining equipment, but it's not going to be easy. And unfortunately the victims are probably not going to be made whole. Um, so anyways, guys, just lo lo like long story short, really, really be, really be, uh, spec like, like invent, like don't invest in crypto, I guess is what I'm saying. Like really have a, a hard eye on these things, right? They said to have raised $25 million for a fictitious bank. Okay. Like these guys went YOLO on fraud, like a fictitious bank. Guys, come on. So anyways, 
I, I would say I hope that this incentivizes or, or deters criminals from wanting to do Ponzi schemes. But right now, as the news tightens around crypto regulations, I feel like they're scrambling to just get the last little uh, crumbs off the table before it comes in. Of course, this is three years old, right? 2015 to 2019. So these guys have been in jail probably for a while. Um, anyways, Ponzi schemes suck. The victims, you know, these guys are going to jail, but like, I like, I would love to see a piece on the victims because like people's lives get ruined. Marriages end. Some people take their life. Like, I mean, it's the victimization of Ponzi schemes is devastating. Hackers steal $300,000 from DraftKings customers. Sports betting site DraftKings says an undisclosed number of customers lost $300,000 through a suspected credential stuffing campaign. DraftKings says it believes customer accounts were accessed using credentials compromised on other websites. Mm. It appears that once cyber criminals hijacked the DraftKings accounts, they changed the passwords and enabled two-factor authentication for a phone number in their possession, locking out legitimate customers. No DraftKings said they would make whole any customer that was impacted, although the firm presumably has no liability in the case. DraftKings also indicated that they've seen no evidence of a breach on their own site. Yeah, of course they didn't. Okay, so several things here, right? First of all, like, guys, how, how, how are you not using multi-factor authentication? Like, how do I get a bigger soapbox to stand on to scream, turn on MFA, especially when it's something that has to do with your money? Like, seriously, how do you have an account online that has something to do with money and you don't have multi-factor authentication in 2022? It's ridiculous. And, oh, by the way, I'd like to point out that these individuals obviously did password reuse because the criminals got the password from somewhere else and then just logged in. And I know, I know, I know, I know Carl doesn't want to remember multiple passwords and Carl just wants to get, you know, wants to put 200 down on a parlay for the Sunday uh, matinee games. But bro. It's freaking money. The only thing I am interested, like the one thing that I'm actually surprised about is that they were only able to steal $300,000. That makes me believe that A, people aren't really keeping a lot of money in their account because <clears throat> the, the bad guys had to log into multiple accounts, right? So the, the creds have to work on multiple accounts. Then they have to go through the trouble of, uh, well, they changed the password and they enable MFA, right? So good on the criminals for doing the best practices. And then they have to move the money out. A couple, couple of things that make me wonder, and people in chat, if you use DraftKings, holler at me. I don't understand how the criminals get the money out. It's not, I don't think DraftKings is crypto, right? So how do you move the money out? You'd have to tie a bank account to it in order to pull the money. And at that point, there's a paper trail. Again, I don't know if this is international and there's like extradition laws or something like that. The fact that, um, you know, it sucks, it sucks. But dudes, $300,000 for DraftKings is like, Great cash, homie. no big deal. Like, no big deal. They probably clear 300000 in the time it took us to listen to this story. DraftKings is massive, 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 okay? So, you know, this is less a story about DraftKings getting, you know, co not compromised, because they weren't compromised, customers of DraftKings getting compromised and more of an opportunity to illustrate that you cannot reuse passwords and that you should implement multi-factor authentication. Guy, like, you know what? Bookmark this story. And when the Super Bowl comes around, use this story to educate people on why they should not be using the same password or use it as an opportunity to put a little webinar on how to set up a password vault. Because a lot of people gamble at the Super Bowl, even casual gamblers, right? Like might, you know, get in on a squares or, or do something. And DraftKings obviously going to be pumping the crap out of commercials around Super Bowl time. So <clears throat> I would just say um, bookmark this and then use it later or actually put together the, the, the email messaging campaign in little video and save it for save it for Super Bowl time, which is like late January, early February. Joshua B is confirming DraftKings uses bank accounts. Yeah, so I, I mean, I guess you could have compromised bank accounts and move the money in there, but then you need money mules to get the money out. It's not, it's not as simple as, you know, crypto, <laughs> which is why criminals like crypto. But anyways, shame on, I mean, dude, you, okay, so final thing on this, all right? Final thing on this. I like 
my kids play Fortnite, okay? They play Fortnite. Fortnite requires you to enable multi-factor authentication if you're going to do anything that actually involves real money in the platform. They don't give you the option. They require it. I think that that is a public service, right? And if you, like, dude, the people who are using DraftKings, guess what? If you put an extra hurdle in front of them to do MFA, they're going to do it. Yeah, you might lose 10% of your customers because they're like, oh, this is just too much. But come on, really? People going to DraftKings, they're going there because they want to bet. They're going to get through the challenges in order to bet. So do a public service, DraftKings. Help your customers out. Require it. Google requires it. It should be required in 2022. Fancy! U.S. Senators ask Fidelity to reconsider Bitcoin 401k. Oh Back in God. April, investment what? firm Fidelity said it wanted to allow investors to put Bitcoin into their 401k accounts. On Monday, three Democratic senators urged Fidelity to reconsider exposing retail clients to Bitcoin in light of the collapse of FTX. Similar concerns were raised by the Department of Labor back in April. In a written letter, the senator stated, quote, The ill-advised, deceptive, and potentially illegal actions of a few have a direct impact on the valuation of Bitcoin and other digital assets, end quote. Dude, are you joking me? I'm a crypto evangelist. I love it, love it, love it. I don't know if they do this in other countries, guys, but in the United States, the 401k is basically your retirement plan. Most people work until they drop dead in the United States. But um, once pensions went away and people started you know, switching jobs and not getting gold watches and crap like that, the 401k came out and the idea was like, oh, you put a little bit in, your, uh, in, in every year. Uh, you know, your employer can match you. There's tax implications that are good. And when you're 65 or whatever age you want to retire, you can go to that money and it can pay you as like a salary. So you don't have to work until you drop dead. So you want it to be like, you, okay, so you want it to be somewhat at risk because you want higher returns, right? But you don't want crypto risk. Are you freaking kidding me? The fact that U.S. senators were asking Fidelity to put to consider crypto as part of a 401k portfolio just speaks to the level of infection and spread of the crypto the crypto bro the crypto life the crypto love all this crap like i uh, with all due respect finfrock i know you love crypto i'm a crypto evangelist <clears throat> i love it love it but love it <clears throat> as we see um, just a minute ago for a $575 million Ponzi scheme or FTX going under for like $12 billion. This is real, real like smoke and mirrors of assets. And to put it into someone's retirement, it, I mean, I can't think of a worse idea. Like besides like, you know, having my shirt pulled over my head and getting punched in the stomach. Like I can't think of a worse idea. This is, the, uh, thank God somebody at Fidelity Fidelity now allows companies to offer its digital assets as part of their 401k lineup. Oh my God. So I guess you can do this at Fidelity. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what, guys, just as a, a matter of action, which I will be doing. So I, I suck at uh, financial management stuff. So I actually have uh, someone help me with those things. I'm going to message them right after this thing and reiterate that I am not interested in crypto in any of my 401k investments. Oh my God. I didn't even think about this, but yeah. So the effect that U.S. senators are talking about this, U.S. senators are not experts in crypto. Um, it's just, this is not good. This is bad. Exactly. Pamela works too hard for crypto risk. Hell yeah. I mean, it's not even, it's not even risk. I mean, it's it, like crypto at scale is a Ponzi scheme, right? The here's my thing. The only reason to invest in crypto is to, so you can get in at a lower value and then sell it to some other sucker at a higher value that is investment fraud i mean you're not willingly pumping the stock in order like you know kardashian or some of these other celebrities tom brady uh who are being who are, who are starting to be kind of spoken in circles of of being brought in for um essentially fraud um we're not pumping that but when you buy crypto guys when you buy crypto there's no value to it you can't go to the store and buy groceries with it yes i know you can go and buy a ferrari in the united arab emirates and stuff like that but really like for paying your water bill for buying food for your family for paying your mortgage or your rent 
you, no one's taking crypto, right? So there, it doesn't have value. The only value in it is the implicit perceived value, uh, future value that you can sell it to someone else who wants to get in on it, right? That's that, that's the freaking game. It's stupid. I'm so pissed. I hate crypto. And now a word from our sponsor, Compile. Preparing a Thanksgiving meal can be stressful, but managing your security and compliance program doesn't have to be. Compile quickly integrates with the tools you use and automates 85% of day-to-day -day tasks, all while providing complete visibility and comprehensive reporting along the way. Learn about Compile today at www.compile.com. That's C-O-M-P-Y-L dot com. All right. I got to get some more coffee here. If you're new here at the mid-roll, we, we, we get a copyright infringer and strike and play Simple Minds. And I take a minute and thank all you guys. But if you just give me a, a moment of grace, I'd like to top off my coffee. That crypto rant got me all hot and bothered here. And not in the good way. All right, here we go. <laughs> Aaron KG slipping it in my DMs. You're never going to believe it. All right, y'all. Hey, I want to thank all of you guys. It's a special time of the year. It is U.S. Thanksgiving tomorrow. Uh, take a moment. Take stock. You all worked your all year. we still got another month to go, but I know many of you, many of you, Carrie, Kimberly, Pamela, Joshua, uh, Aaron, Joel, like so many of you are busted, like Jim Lunn, um, um, Jesus, um, Shane, like, uh, like, dude, so many of you are busting your butt and being consistent and being vigilant. And I want you to like, really take a moment and, and realize the gains you've made. Like I, like, I'm really, really, uh, inspired by all of you and I'm proud of all of you. And for those of you who I didn't mention it, but have been grinding and working, trust me, it's, it's, it's so, it's so worth it. And this has just been a great community. I want to thank you all. I want to take the time to thank you all for making Simply Cyber what it is, okay? Uh, it's been it's been a lot of fun, and I'm looking forward to just, you know, keeping the train running uh, until further notice. So thank all of you. Um, if you do, are you, like, aside from thanking you, if you are getting value from the news stream and you're a regular here or you're new here, this is a pretty normal show, uh, take a moment, just hit the like button. Uh, if you're on the YouTubes, it does help the show. It lets me know that you are enjoying the content and it helps the algorithm push this so we can help more people uh, break into cybersecurity and level up their cybersecurity career. It's awesome. I want to remind everybody that it is Wednesday. And on Wednesdays, I don't know if they're doing it today because of the holiday, but on Wednesday, Red Siege Information Security hosts Wednesday Offensive. Um, if you're interested, it's it's a offensive security company. They have offensive security uh, guest speakers. It's a really cool format. It's like a Zoom call. There's it's like really chill. Uh, you can be a lurker and they don't care. So uh, go to I put the link in chat. They don't ask me to do that. They're not a sponsor or anything. I just like I just like the sh I like that Zoom call that they do and I like the people at Red Seed. So I share it with you because I go to it myself. Obviously, we got the newsletter, so if you want to get a, a custom email from me on Monday mornings, 90-second read with actionable intel, sign up. If you are signed up and you're not getting it, it's either in your spam or your email gateway is blocking it. I've had a couple of people reach out to me. If you're not seeing it in spam, but you definitely are signing up, then you definitely have to sign up with a different email. I'm sorry. I can't, I can't configure your... Can't do it. Um, I can't configure your mail server, right? Red Sea just doing it. The other one for Blue Team on Thursday is off for Thursday. Okay, thanks, Carrie. So Carrie's confirmed that Red Siege is doing theirs, and Recon Infosex Thursday Defensive is canceled. Just like Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing is not happening tomorrow, but we will be here on Friday morning for a very unusual episode of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing. Thank you, Cyber Kill Jane, Jessica Probst. Let's get the la 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 laws. I mean, if we're going to get a copyright strike, let's get a full copyright strike, right? <laughs> All right. All right, let's get back to the news, y'all.
Hackers breach energy orgs via bugs in discontinued web server. Back in April, Recorded Future reported that state-backed Chinese hacking groups targeted multiple Indian electrical grid operators, including Tata Power. The report noted the attackers hacked internet-exposed cameras, but didn't specify how. On Tuesday, Microsoft clarified that the hackers exploited a vulnerable component in the BOA web server, a software solution discontinued since 2015. Oh. BOA servers are pervasive across IoT devices because of the web server's inclusion in popular software development kits. Microsoft says it expects more of these attacks because in a single week, it has detected more than 1 million internet-exposed BOA server okay, components. All right, my my uh my off air my off camera producer my seven year old off air producer is telling me that I need to be sure to tell you guys what I'm thankful for before I get off the stream. Oh oh I see. All right, thank you. Uh yeah I'll do that. All right, so guys, you guys might remember that a little while ago, uh, Indian energy company Tata was hacked. Apparently. I have a couple things to tell you about this story. One, the, the hackers got through a bug in a web server, okay? So anytime you have internet-facing assets, you have to be mindful of them. The fact that they were running a web server that went end of life in 2015 is a major problem, right? So either A, they didn't know about it, which I find egregious because you have things like Shodan that you can use to find assets on your network, or you should be running a vulnerability scanner on your network. Two, they were running a, a piece of soft, dude, web servers, there's like a million web servers out there, okay? Like tons of options. To use one that went end of life in 2015, I'm not gonna completely lambaste you because uh, Equifax, when they got hacked a while ago because of their Apache struts, um, the you know people were like, oh, the patches have been out for a while. Like Equifax, you suck. And in reality, uh, you couldn't just patch Apache struts. It would have broke a ton of stuff. So it's possible that they had some type of web application running on this BOA web server that they could not patch or could not fix. Having said that, that web server went end of life seven years ago. So you've had seven years to come up with a transition plan. That is unacceptable that, that nothing happened. Unfortunately, I feel like it's one of those ones where like, oh, it's not broke, don't fix it. Or somebody like Justin Gold set up the web server, high fives everybody, and then Justin Gold got a better paying job down the road. And everybody was like, I don't know what it does. I don't know how to fix it. I don't know where it sits. I don't know where it works. Just leave it. It doesn't do anything, right? Or or it just went end of life. And like, they they here's another thing, guys. Like, you have to sunset systems when you're done with them. You can't just move on. Just like when people quit the company, you have to shut off their access. You can't just leave it. So many people overlook the decommission and the and the like the, the 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 part of the process that happens at the end of the life cycle because nobody's kicking and screaming that the system is still up, right? System goes down, you try to access something you don't have access. People are like, ah, ah, I can't access it. Give me a give me a, I need to talk to someone right now, right? You quit your job, or this or they replace it with a brand new system. Nobody is calling you like. Listen, bro, I can still access that web server. This is ridiculous. Like, nobody is saying that. And that's why this 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 technology stays forever. And it's bullcrap because of the attack surface it introduces. Like, as an information security guy, this pisses me off. It's hard enough. Listen, guys, it's hard. Hold on, I got to go big cam here. It's hard enough. It's hard enough to protect an organization with just the tech stack that they actually use for business operations. When you start adding legacy tech or end of life tech or, te or shadow IT or any of this other jazz, you're literally like tying my hand behind my back and being like, let's see if you can protect the organization now. Or like both hands blindfold my shoelaces together. And like, I don't know, like, throwing one of those like stink bombs that kids used to drop in like middle school or high school, you'd be like, Oh my God, what is that? I can't get away from it. Like that's what's going on when you introduce all this other, um, these challenges. InfoSec is already a hard game. There's no reason to stack the deck against us. My mitt, my God. So anyways, like surprise, a, a, a piece of technology that's internet facing that's seven years old. I mean, seven years end of life led to a breach. My, oh, like, I'm stunned. Like, like, come on. Come on, man. Fashy! So ridiculous. Seriously.
Experts warn threat actors may abuse popular red team tool. Researchers from Proofpoint are warning that a new red teaming tool dubbed Nighthawk may soon be leveraged by threat actors. In 2021, MDSEC created the tool, which is an advanced C2 framework in a commercially distributed remote access trojan designed for legitimate use. Proofpoint's analysis also revealed an extensive list of configurable evasion techniques within the product's code. Proofpoint has seen a rise in threat actors leveraging red teaming tools because it helps with complicating attribution, evading endpoint detection, and streamlining the hacking process. Proofpoint concluded that security vendors should take note of Nighthawk's capabilities in order to deliver effective protection to their customers. Ooh. All right, so a couple things here, one, including a little shout out to ROP, Return Oriented Programming. That was like one of the more advanced things that I learned in my PhD. Cra it's crazy. Like, there's so many smart people out there. I I'm not one of them. <laughs> but the people who came up with ROP and ROP gadgets and JOP, uh, which is like the advance of ROP, uh, those people are brilliant. Um, so here's here's the here's the key takeaway on this one, guys. Couple things. One, um, yes, there are tools famously Cobalt Strike, but there are other tools, Nighthawk and I think Rattel is the other one, Brute Rattel, that allow their advanced C two frameworks. Okay, so like what's really quickly, two things. One, what do we got here? Kayla Rose with the membership squad. Thanks, Kayla Rose. Be sure to check out those emotes. We got a brand new Snake Eyes Ninja one in there, Kayla. So hop on that one. All right. And Chinadu's asking, how do we keep threat actors from using this? Okay, so here's two things. One, red teams and professional pen testing organizations that are designed to help organizations defend themselves use these technologies, these advanced C2 frameworks. Nighthawk, Brute Retail, Cobalt Strike is the, is the most famous one. Well, these organizations sell... You know, they, they're supposed to be very um, dis uh, practice discretion when choosing who the clients are that get to use it. Like you get vetted. You have to prove that you're a legit organization. Fine. Here's the problem. I pop an organization that is using Cobalt Strike. I get the code and now I, I have access to the softwares, right? Or I, I get a cracked license key, whatever. I don't know enough about... Um, the cobalt strike and stuff to know if there's like some backend licensing server that connects to it or whatever but it, it tons of threat actors get access to these tools and then weaponize them it's it's just like a handgun right a handgun can protect your home or it can be used to rob a bank these advanced c2 frameworks can be used to help find flaws in your business or be used to compromise your business now uh chinadu asks how can we keep people from doing this well the, the easy way to do it is whether you're trying to defend from a threat actor or from a, a red team that you've hired to uh, check, check your defenses, you have to practice security operations. How are you looking? Um, like, what are you doing to protect your org? What are you doing to detect uh, these uses? Are you looking for beaconing? Like all the best things. Now, you might be like, well, Jerry, like if Cobalt Strike is all the rage, why are people switching to Nighthawk? If you guys remember just, I want to say just yesterday on the stream, um, Google, yeah, look at this. Google released 165 Yara rules just yesterday to detect Cobalt Strike, right? So if the tool sets, if the tool sets that are, are being used by threat actors are getting more and more defensive detections, more, you know, more defenses, they're going to get detected more often and it's going to be less fruitful for the bad guys. So what do you do if you're a bad guy? You pivot to another tool that's just as good or not quite as good, but it's 90% as good. And then you move on because those Yara rules, these aren't detecting Nighthawk, right? So that's the deal there. Uh, I do want to point out something like I'm not an expert on C2 frameworks, but if you're kind of curious, like what is a C2 framework? Why would you want to use it here? Look at this really quickly. Because this is um, lesson learned. Oh, hold on. I know that this is all um, this is all um, pixelated, but basically, the C two framework. When you get in there, you can have uh, these compromised systems, and instead of like having to jump into one system, jump into one system, you first of all, Cobalt Strike will give you like a visual picture of like your your the network you've compromised, the assets you own. Plus, you can do all sorts of advanced things like. Um, like you can chain machines together. So like this far right one is sending its data to this 
machine right here. And this machine is sending its data out to this one and then out to the internet versus versus all of the machines pushing out to the internet, right? It would look a little more obvious if like eight machines were all talking to one random IP in, in you know, Belarus. But if just one is, you know, maybe it maybe it hides a little bit better, okay? So this is, there's way more functionality to C2 frameworks, but that's basically like a really, really, really quick and dirty way. And there's lots of different C2 frameworks, many, many different ones, okay? So that's why, and that's what's going on. So the TLDR here is make sure you look for Nighthawks TTPs and do what you can to protect your organization from it. Ducktail hackers target Facebook business accounts. On Tuesday, researchers at WithSecure warned that a Vietnamese hacking operation dubbed Ducktail is targeting individuals and companies operating on Facebook's ads and businesses platform. The researchers spotted the campaign early this year, but say the group recently evolved its tactics. For example, Ducktail added new spear phishing avenues like WhatsApp and has enhanced their malware to better evade detection by changing file formats to look more legitimate and has also added more robust methods of obtaining attacker-controlled email addresses. With Secure has published tips to protect businesses, including urging employees to use separate accounts for personal and business purposes. Yeah. All right, so I'll just age myself here. If you're between, I'd say, 37 and 45, when you heard the story, did you in your mind go, DuckTales, woohoo? Oh yeah, look at Nathan Bullen knows what I'm talking about. All right, um, so here's the deal, guys. Um, it's, you know, it's a Vietnamese-based uh, threat actor group, hacker group. They're targeting Facebook business accounts. They're using WhatsApp as the vehicle in order to um, get you initially compromised. Hey, WhatsApp, like, uh, here's a message from WhatsApp. Hey, it's Jerry. Like, what's up? Or, hey, are you around? Or, hey, dinner was great last night. They, like, all these different, like, hooks. They've got them all over the place. Um, don't, re like, here's, here's, here's something to tell Carl. Carl! Don't reply to random messages in WhatsApp. I've got news for you. That really attractive woman that's messaging you randomly is not interested in you. It's, it's a group of people and they're trying to get into your uh, Facebook account. Now, if your business runs face on Facebook, oh, John Har with the uh, squad membership. John Har, get up in those, uh, get all up in those emotes, John. So um, basically the, the TLDR here is two part. One, educate your end users that the WhatsApp is a vehicle, same with Telegram uh, or even iMessage. Messaging apps, threat actors will just throw fishes in there uh, and try to trick you. Second of all, if your business uses Facebook for promotions or if they run their entire business on Facebook, obviously there's an elevated threat um, around that, right? So the likelihood of the risk calculation has gone up because there's observed activity in the wild actively happening. What do you do about this? Well, the key thing, and they said it in the chat, uh, excuse me, in the podcast, is you should not use personal accounts to log in and manage business accounts. This is access management 101 people. And we see this more often with IT administrators using their domain admin credentials to, to drive around and, and you know do regular business, which is terrible. Same thing here. Yeah. Hey, guess what? Like, Carl, I, I get that it's inconvenient to have to log out and log back in, but you know what it does? Protects our business, right? So like, and this sucks because it's it's hard. It's not hard, I guess. I mean, you have to set the permissions on the on the business account in order to not allow Carl's personal account to log in. But people are usually pretty lax with permissions and controls, especially when it comes to accessing cloud-based systems, um, especially if the person who set it up isn't an InfoSec person. It's like the social media manager. And they're like, oh yeah, no, sure, Carl. Carl access everything. The, the, the Vietnamese group is basically sending a WhatsApp chat, getting in there, tricking you to give them, the, either give them your credentials or they, they fish the credentials somehow by, you know, a fake landing page for a Facebook uh, landing page or something like that. And then boom, they're into your business. I don't know what the actual impact is. So let's just pretend for a second a threat actor logs into your Facebook business account. What do they do? I don't know what they do at that point. You know what I mean? Like what's the actual impact of it? Um... I guess they can start phishing your customers uh, because it'll look legit coming from the actual business account. Uh, they might be able, I don't know if Facebook business ties into any financials. 
bank accounts, stuff like that. Maybe they could go in and change a bank account routing number on the Facebook. Um, so anyways, you don't want threat actors in your Facebook business account, period. End of story. Ohio universities received $5 million in school safety funding. 33 colleges and universities in Ohio will receive a total of $5 million in funding for security projects as part of the 2022 Campus Safety Grant Program. The program was funded with support from the Ohio Legislature, and funds will be used for physical security enhancements such as security cameras, door locks, alarms, public address systems, and metal detectors. In order to receive grant funding, institutions had to first conduct a security vulnerability assessment to identify areas needing safety enhancements. Ohio State, Kent State, and Bowling Green are among the field of grant recipients. All right. I mean, okay, so, yeah, so Ohio universities are going to get $5 million in funding. Where's the money coming from? I kind of wanted to know that. Um, fun, yeah, like, where's the money coming from? It was funded with support from the Ohio legislator in Senate. Okay, so this was in Ohio State... Um, this was an Ohio, like the state of Ohio funded venture. And even though it says safety, um, what do we got here? Ooh. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. Thanks. Thanks, Cybersecurity Central. Uh, I appreciate it so much. Definitely. Listen, this is all around physical safety. Right now, uh, unfortunately, there is a, I don't know how, if it doesn't get reported in other countries or if the United States is just like, you know, the front runner, but. There's been a lot of school shootings, okay? There's been a lot of, um, I mean, they had the shooter in Las Vegas, just like shooting into a crowd. That, like, uh, there's, there's, um, like mass shootings. There's lots of them, and some, some, uh, ways to control that is to add metal detectors, to add more people walking around with guns, right? You know, there's, there's arguments on both sides of the fence on whether that's a good idea or not. But the point is, this is not really cybersecurity. This is exclusively physical security. And I would argue it's literally addressing mass shootings only. Like the, the, the deterrence that they talked about, uh, CCTV, f f security guards, metal detectors, those are all associated with shootings, right? So that's what the story is. Uh, but it is worth noting, guys, like as cool as zero day leet hacks are, in our world, a comprehensive cybersecurity program does have physical security controls. Um, and, and that's just the way it is. Th there's three types of controls, right? There's administrative, operational, and technical. And there's there's multiple risks. 85% of our risks are ducktails. Woohoo! like right threat actor groups criminals cyber threat actors apts whatever but there is real concern for environmental risks and natural risks right and what's the difference natural would be like a hurricane a flood right if you had a data center in new orleans when katrina hit you probably lost everything unless you prepared right um if you have a data center up in you know barrow alaska and you don't have the data center um heated properly right it could freeze literally right so you've got to consider those things and then really quickly the environmental ones is like if you had like a lot of data centers need air conditioning to cool down well if you put an air conditioner above the data ser center servers and it leaks condensation down on the servers you could have a problem i did an engagement one time where they had the right fire extinguishers for uh putting out electric fires but the fire extinguisher was behind the server rack. So if the server rack caught fire, you wouldn't be able to physically actually get to the fire extinguisher. That's actually an example where compliance checks the box, but the actual implementation of the security, it, it, it wouldn't work. Like they would just, the whole server rack would have melted before they got to the fire extinguisher. So anyways, the more you know, hey, actually, you know what? Throw uh, Snake Eyes in there. That's a, that's a yo, Joe, the more you know, right? Uh, knowing's half the battle right there. Uh, FizSec is part of our world, although we don't talk about it often because InfoSec, uh, you know, we, we get wrapped around the axle on technical stuff. And that does it for today's cybersecurity. Head that does it for today's cybersecurity, but that does not do it for us hanging out. Guys, I would like to remind you of a couple things. One, we actually did like a really cool Renegade live stream yesterday on the NIST risk management framework. If you were there, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. If you, yeah, look at all those snake eyes. If you did not catch it and you're interested in learning NIST risk management framework, I literally did like an hour and 15 minute 
comprehensive deep dive into the RMF. I, I was just feeling it, so I did it. Um, I want to remind everybody that later today at 11.30 a.m., I will be playing Threat Gen Red versus Blue. I won't be playing, actually. Um, Greg, one of our lead dev uh, uh, testers, will be playing. He's actually developed a technique called Greg's Wild Ride. This is a very um, advanced technique uh, on the red side of, uh, you know, it's very interesting for attacking and winning uh, the game. Uh, we're going to be uh, watching him play. I'll be commentating and giving my thoughts on the reality of it. Um, so that'll be fun. And it'll be a hangout right before uh, uh, Thanksgiving. What's up, Mervin? Mervin with the love. All right, guys. Um, I also want to ask, you know, my, my seven-year-old wanted me to uh, ask all of you, what, what are you guys thankful for? I'd love to go back and read, read chat. I'll read it with my son after the stream. What are you all thankful for? Um, I'd love to hear it. I'd love to know. Uh, everybody's got their own story. Everybody's got their own um, challenges and, and things to be thankful for. Go. What, I don't know what you want. So um, it's good. Thankful for no breaches this year. Eric Silberman. Hey, cheers to you, my friend. That's great. With 98% of businesses having cyber attacks, no breaches is a good win. I love it. Okay. Let's see. My kid, my wife, my brain. Yeah, Jay Smith. Love it, love it, love it. Oh, Tom Bishop, you're too kind. You're too kind. I appreciate that. What's that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, throw that on. Are you wanting to be on this? Okay, come on. Uh, being able to be with family and no cyber incidents. Thankful to finish the degree. Congratulations, Justin Loken. I'm thankful for my family. There we go. There we go. There's my seven-year-old, my, my co-producer. Thank you so much for being here and helping me with the show. Okay. I really like that. Story. Yeah. I love it. You want to be here too? All right. We're getting some love here from the production team. There's my my 10-year-old. You want to say hi, Grayson? All right. Slide, slide on. People are saying you guys are cute. Nice. Jim Wales break it into the cyber world. Congratulations, Jim Chinadu. Thankful to be alive. Hey, yeah. Yeah. Cr Punch fear in the face, Chinadu. I love it. Omar. <laughs> yeah. More art, more jokes. Yeah. Behind the scenes crew. BTS crew. That's right. Thanks to the family. I love it. Alicia Jerry. Cyber Kill Jane. Happy Thanksgiving to you, too. Mervin, crush that interview. Hey, Mervin, I've got tons of content on Simply Cyber um, around interviews. Oh, thanks, Kayla. Uh, hey, Kayla says thanks for making the show more fun. You, you want to show Cookie off? Really quick. Lovely kids. Chinadu, my, my son. Uh, here. He's got a, that's his cookie elf. All right, move on over. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. No show tomorrow. No show tomorrow. Hey, Joel Belton. Lots to be thankful for, Carrie. Yeah, Carrie, you've been busting your hump this year. Good on you, man. Health family in the GRC course. Oh, thank you so much. I hope you enjoy that GRC course. Uh, Brandon Parsons. Love it. <laughs> hey, Cookie. Happy Thanksgiving. Guys, I hope you guys get to eat well tomorrow. I hope you get to be with those you love. All right. Good luck on the job interviews. Absolutely. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Oh, thanks, Shinadu. I, I, seriously, this community is, is awesome. You guys are all awesome. Have a good day. Happy Thanksgiving. Need that logo. Yeah, Justin Loken. Got to catch them all, man. No doubt. No doubt. Prime Ribbon Yorkshire Pudding. Love it. Uh, let's see. Hey, Shane Himes. Thanks so much. You're part of the community. And I love it. Let's see. John Dela Cruz. Happy Thanksgiving to you and the community. Nathan, Nathan had to reschedule though. That's tough, man. Oh yeah. <laughs> there you go. A yeet for everyone. We'll do two yeets. One for today. One for tomorrow. Oh, thanks so much, Kayla. I appreciate that gonna be fun got some got some big news coming for y'all next week oh no pamela's allergic to turkey careful pamela all right good stuff everyone well thank you thank you all be good we'll see you on friday morning at 8 a.m eastern time 
for the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing. Till then, take care, everybody. Yeah. <laughs>